Okay. Good morning, everyone. So, if I have, if I can have your attention, please. So, if you could take your seats. Uh, my name is Mahesh Bandi. I am on the faculty here at OS Graduate University. Uh, for the since the beginning, I was one of the founding faculty. Uh, by by trade, I am a physicist, but I wear different hats. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to to moderate this uh, panel discussion today. Uh, this was supposed to be done by my senior colleague, Professor Nick Shannon, but he's unfortunately under the weather. So when at 7.30 p.m. last night, I was told to s step in as the moderator. I asked myself, what am I going to do? So let me, I, look, humor is important in life, so I'll start with that. It reminded me of Sir Benjamin Franklin's statement, everything in moderation, including moderation. So that's how I'll do it. <laughs> All right, so look, science uh, or the evolution of science is uh, akin to the polymerization process. Uh, the probability that a, pol a polymer would crystallize is extremely low, but when it starts, it's a runaway process. It took a long time in, 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 in the evolution of civilization, of humankind, for the scientific process, the scientific method to take root. But once it did, it, it's, we're still living through that runaway process. So for a long time, discoveries were quite sporadic. They were unrelated to each other, uh, and scholars and uh, uh, and philosophers, they worked on various problems at the same time. They, there was no distinction. And, uh, and then Europe went through the Middle Ages, but there were still discoveries being made in Asia and uh, Northern Africa, etc. But it was still not systematized until we have the 14th century and the Renaissance uh, begins, El Renacimiento as it's called. And then in the 16th century, we have the scientific revolution starting with Copernicus. By 17th century, we have the Age of Enlightenment and Sir Francis Bacon, who famously put it as the scientific method through empiricism, it takes root. And we are still living through that process. So I have a set of series of questions for the panelists and the way we'll work through it is, uh, I'll ask a question, I'll pose a question and uh, each panelist will have a couple of uh, minutes to share their thoughts. Uh, I have drawn these questions with an eye towards the fact that our panelists are drawn both from practitioners of science as professors, as academics, but who are also leaders and policy setters uh, in scientific and academic management, which is, the view is very different once, once you get to that stage. So, uh, some of these questions have actually already been answered, uh, but let me pose them no nonetheless. So, in my first question, in your opinion, why is interdisciplinary research the need of the art today? The, the reason I ask this is the systematization of knowledge into, say, engineering, mathematics, physics, biology, etc., has served us very well for the last 100 plus years. But today, we all agree that interdisciplinary research, interdisciplinary education is important. But why is it important? So let me start with my colleague Amy Shen, and then we'll move from left to right. Uh, and uh, we have Red Register sitting right there, so he'll, he'll prompt you when, when you're close to the two-minute mark. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Amy Shen. I have been a professor at OIS for exactly 10 years, and I became the provost two years ago. Um, so I, I have gained a lot of perspectives in terms of uh, just the difference being just a pure scientist versus also um, getting involved with the administrative and decision-making process. Uh, just a little background of my education background. Um, I got my PhD degree in theoretical and applied mechanics. So by itself, it's highly interdisciplinary. Um, so our curriculum covers applied mathematics, uh, engineering, and also physics. But uh, about more than 20 years ago, so this discipline actually in the United States was considered to be out of date and uh, there's no more such departments because it did not contribute to uh, the, uh, the world news and, and ranking. So, so I, I believe that's a bad decision. But anyways, um, and um, after that I became a postdoc at Harvard, I started working on microfluidics. So again, so, so that's a quite interdisciplinary area. Um, so I, I have continued to do research in microfluidics. Um, but after I moved to OIS, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I was able to leverage our curi curiosity-driven research, so I expanded uh, uh, more actually into uh, applied research areas to, to apply my knowledge in biotechnology, 
and lab on a chip, organ on a chip kind of applications. So to answer your question, so I think, uh, um, so from my personal experience, I always believe interdisciplinary, it's uh, very important uh, just to, to get uh, both for education and also for research impact. Um, so nowadays, especially, I think we're all facing global challenges like climate change, um, public health crisis, and also in terms of uh, uh, the agriculture, agriculture and uh, food science. I think it's very important for everyone to work together and uh, find uh, solutions in a collective and creative ways. How am I doing? Oh, okay. So um, maybe I should stop and uh, give the time for my colleagues. I'm really grateful to give in that, uh, that, but I also have to apologize for, um, for not introducing myself when I had, I knew I was going to run a short of time, so I just skipped that. So, so uh, Tobe is my nickname, um, because it's hard to pronounce for other than Swedes, Torbjörn. And I started as an engineering student in Uppsala, uh, on the east coast of Sweden, and then went into pure mathematics, did that in potential theory and uh, discrete groups. And after that, I felt a bit lonely, so I wanted to could be, become applied again. So I, I looked into maybe physics, but then I, I read something uh, actually at Chalmers. Uh, the physics problem said that if you, uh, we can help you with anything from quarks to galaxies. But then I, I thought once more that if I'm going to move into an, an application there, it's probably going to be either quarks or galaxies because of the, most of the low-hanging fruits are taken in between there. So I, I thought, uh, what, why not biology instead? So that was how I came into that. I thought it was really interesting. And I did that very slowly through a postdoc, still in the pure part in, at Cambridge and then in Stony Brook, close to Harvard. Uh, and uh, going back also Institute Mette Gleffler and then to, to Chalmers and University of Gothenburg. And uh, after I had a, a PhD student finish for me in this pure part, I, I left that and I tried to work with biological problems ever since, which is really fun and great. So going to the question here that I think we shouldn't, I mean, if we are, have a big challenge, which we, we seems to be getting more and more of, then we should do what we, what it takes to solve them. And if we limit ourselves by saying, oh, you can only use these tools in that drawer, then, then we are, we're harming ourselves in that possibility. So, so let the problem be in the center and use the tool that, that you needed and forget about where you come from. <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you. So uh, I'm, my name is Ugur Abdullah. I am a professor of mathematics. I'm uh, at OIST for the last two years. I'm head of the analysis and partial differential equations unit. So that's my field. And prior to that, I was a professor in the Florida Institute of Technology in the United States for 20 years. So my uh, PhD and doctoral science degree from former Soviet Union, Academy of Sciences, and then in, I have an habilitation doctoral degree from Germany. And then my field is a partial differential equations, which is, is a central in mathematics. It's both in pure and in applied mathematics. And there's a, a question, is a, is a great question. I would like just to give the perspective of mathematicians' perspective to this question and, and in importance of interdisciplinary science. I think that uh, not only interdisciplinary science is, is important, but I think the whole modern science is, was born from interdisciplinary science. I think this crucial revolutionary change in, for modern science is coming from 1687, when Isaac Newton published Principia of Mathematica. Now why? What was this revolutionary? So that time, I think if you look to perspective, Mechanics was an applied science, but it was in the situation of chaotic, sporadic collection of facts. It was kind of like a descriptive science. There was a lot of people applying all these existing methods to mechanics, and that's exactly what's going on, for example, nowadays with biology. But applying method of mathematics, existing method to mechanics, that was not really contributing to creating, making the change. But change f came from exactly when Newton wrote this. And in Newton's, Isaac Newton's own word, by the way, I read this at some, I was required to read this book because I was a member of other panel when we discussed one of the great books. He, in his own writing, he said that 
That's exactly the idea. He said, our goal is not to apply the method of mathematics to science, but we're going to apply science to mathematics. What he meant with that, there was a rigorous scientific field that time was a geometry. That's Euclidean geometry, which is axiomatic science, rigorous science, and what Newton did was opposite applying methods of mathematics to science. He just took this sporadic form of mechanics and applied it literally to this geometry. So he actually, if you know in his book, he doesn't call this, and that's where there was born, a new science was born, which is classical mechanics. And by the way, in his book, if you read, he doesn't call this laws of physics. He calls them axioms of physics. Axiom one, axiom two, and they were just coming directly from geometric axioms. He said, we just have to find the right concept. Instead of point, line, we have now velocity, we'll have density. So that was a time when exactly, so all modern scientists, we are all spiritual descendants, so that was the most happiest and successful marriage between mathematics and physics, and that's where the modern science starts. And that's an example of how this interdisciplinary science will continue to serve. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, so I am a materials scientist. That means interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary work. Now I'm going to pose you with a problem. Do we know what we are talking about? How do you define interdisciplinary research? Yes. I've come to realize this causes problems in all the rules we always discuss because we don't actually agree. I will test it on you. You have discipline. A works and B. There's also a problem that needs different uh, disciplines to attack. This gives you results plus a new discipline, C. That is how academia is developing according to me. So uh, if you take multidisciplinary research, we haven't spoken about that. Some people mix these up, actually. Uh, you take A plus B and it gives results plus A prime. Now a much better A because they have developed their strength yeah. within their discipline plus B prime. In both cases, it has to tend. You should not <coughs> institutionalize in these because then A and B or A prime B prime will lose their strength. They will not be interested for other parties to celebrate in the next turn of an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary world. But, but test this at home. You will realize that people will not agree with this because they think it's actually multi or vice versa. Okay. And Walter. Yeah. yeah, good uh, morning, everybody. My name is Ulf Dickmann. Um, I have been trained in uh, theoretical physics, statistical physics, collective phenomena. And then I was always interested in the complexification of systems. How do systems become more ordered from less order? And I realized I had to learn about ecology and evolution. So that was my next station that took me into systems analysis and also some smattering of uh, social dynamics and game theory. Now, you can tell from that trajectory that I'm inherently working interdisciplinarily at the interface of mathematics, physics, and biology, uh, even other fields connecting to sustainability science. And uh, I always enjoyed that very much. And uh, I would try to organize my thoughts. Why, why do I think it's such a great way to do science? And I came up with, with three clusters of benefits or advantages. The first is opportunity. Uh, interdisciplinary research offers fantastic opportunities for progress at interfaces. And I think it was Heisenberg who said that the key revolutions in science happen at the interface of disciplines. Mm -hmm. So we have um, what the Americans call water cooler talk. You meet serendipit serendipitously at an opportunity that is created for you by an institution and you discover new lateral thinking, assertive memory, um, ways of looking at your problems. So that is uh, curiosity-driven, that is energizing. We enjoy doing that. It leads to surprises 
And uh, this is what I call the opportunity cluster. Then the second cluster is utility. So when we have real systems and real challenges, they often cry for interdisciplinary answers. We have complex systems. We require integrative, holistic, and anti-technocratic solutions. And that can only be delivered by interdisciplinary science. Another way of putting that is to say science needs to become mission-centric. Put the needs first and use the tools accordingly. The third cluster of uh, enthusiasm I have for interdisciplinarity is about connectivity and all the links it offers. My experience in talking with journalists is that they often much more resonate with interdisciplinary thought than with disciplinary thought, so that works very well. It's very good for engagement with the public, and it's a step towards what is called transdisciplinarity, not to be confused with interdisciplinarity, which is about co-design and co-production of knowledge. So this is what I think is great about interdisciplinarity. I want to close with a few remarks about challenges, if I may. It's all not gold. It's all not rosy alone. There are big challenges, and in institutions we have to face them. The challenges come from the educational preparations, which are still so much disciplinarily guided. So people arrive at this mission-centric focus without necessarily having the breadth of education they need to contribute. Teams, of course, are an answer to that. Then establishing a common language often takes ages. And during these ages, you are not productive. You are not embellishing your CV with publications. So that's a bit of a problem, especially for younger scientists. And then um, careers are still so much departmentalized. And if you want to find a professorship at a university, you have to excel in a discipline still most of the time. And then finally, I want to mention humility. When it comes to interdisciplinary research, we all realize how partially adequate our knowledge and our skills are. So I believe modelers and interdisciplinary modelers at that need to be grown up with a, a good dosage of humility when it comes to their craft. Thank you. Thank you, Ulf. Uh, actually, you are naturally leading me on to my next question, which was basically, what are the opportunities and the challenges you are seeing out there in developing this interdisciplinary ethos, both as practitioners of science, as well as as policymakers and leaders of the scientific academic enterprise? Mm -hmm. So since Ulf has already started that, how about we move right to left now and proceed with Professor Hultmann? Thank you. I will start with the opportunity. Um, and that is one, to bring the strongest groups together that are otherwise not self-organizing. But with that comes also the challenge. Um, so to do that, um, it's not happening because the, the vice president or the president is not, not encouraging them, but the system is not awarding such action unless you have funding agencies that come out from the external and, and, and ask for this. I think it works during the time of the funding period. I do not inspect what happens after three or five years, um, but I have a suspicion that some of these collaborations are disintegrating. And maybe, and probably as I draw on the board, they, they should. Otherwise, the university will find itself with a growing number of centers that ask for different status, and then there is less money to do um, reforms and development. So one has to be careful not to institutionalize uh, thematic areas, or one has to have a mechanism that is built in that they should disintegrate after X years. Thank you. Uh, well, y yes, it's a question actually I would like to continue, like uh, what uh, example again, perspective from uh, mathematics side. So when Interdisciplinary science, after uh, as, uh, Newton's discovery, was created 200 years. Physics was basically developing the potential theory until it reached again the mathematical key point when Gauss discovered this, his famous uh, mathematical theorem, which then understood that 
in order to understand two existing forces at time, was a gravity force and an electromagnetic force, it's basically you have to understand potential satisfies the same equation. And that was a, a partial differential equation, was once a potential equation. So this created the field physics became a potential theory, which became then after that field of mathematics. Nowadays, it's a field of pure mathematics in the intersection of probability theory, partial differential equations analysis. And if you look back then later, the next revolution came when Einstein discovered his, made a great discovery, it was completely different form than was Newton's discovery. He basically made his discovery with a thought experiment, which was just also unique. But then he knew that his, his discovery will not be complete without this mathematical, and that's when he derived his famous Einstein field equation, so he's actually also one of the great mathematicians side of physics, but this was exactly continuations of potential theory. So what is, is I'm bringing the point here, this, it's, it's an extremely important point to, nowadays there was a tendency, like I know as a, I was chair of the math department in the United States, that was a problem in education to simplify the mathematical education in the sake of this so-called as interdisciplinary science. And then it's understood that this is a wrong tendency. There is, if we talk about the interdisciplinary science, there is no mathematical biology when you have a 50% mathematics and 50% biology. You should have 100% mathematics and 100% biology. So training half-half is not the right way. So that's why it is extremely important in education to keep the rigorous education. And how to address this, of course, in this area is a way is actually to kind of separate the education. There shouldn't be one sequence, but you have to keep the rigorous mathematical development and also biological development side by side, as in training should be never sacrificing one for the sake of the other. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I very much agree with my colleague here. And I, I love that you brought up potential theory. I just want to add also that famous did this, you know, magnificent work about the Brownian motion there, which is then essential in this relation that uh, potential theory, I think, is one of the few fields that actually started to go together with another field. Otherwise, you, you, we see a lot of spreading out, which well, is really Robert lovely. Wiener's great discovery. Exactly, now. yeah. So, so it, it combined the two, probability and um, um, PDs there in a really nice manner. But what I would like to also to say here, one of the challenges I think that we have, uh, not only for collaboration, but a thing I'm a little bit surprised of that, going back to, to old Greeks again, Thales, 500 before our time, he was accordingly the one that started with asking question why, why is it like this, not only stating a fact. And that, that is something that we have ho hold very dear and, and high uh, in the academics until a few years ago, I think, when we, we stopped asking that. Not we, I mean, uh, if, I, if I'm a bit provocative, and I, I had a discussion with Curtis McMullen in, in Harvard when, when he, he was really upset that day because the next day they would vote in the faculty senate to remove the, the course that everybody had to take in the beginning that is related to, to uh, quantitative analysis. So somebody, they have to take one of these and they're going to move that into instead uh, uh, data analysis. So things are changing so rapidly. And recently I went to um, Stanford then at the HI High the thing, that I know Hans, you've been there, and there was a researcher talking about, oh, I think this is so fun because my niece, she, she always runs around asking questions, why, why, why? I think we should talk about why. So, so the, the young researcher has, has, has now uh, need to take up the question why from other sources than Thales. I think it's, it's strange that we, we let that happen so easily. So. Yeah, just to actually a natural follow-up. I, I think uh, talking about opportunities, I think, uh, so I would say nowadays our graduate students, the newer generation uh, students, I think there's tremendous opportunity in comparison to when I was a PhD student. So the internet, the AI, and uh, gene editing, and uh, so many new technologies and new fields, and I think we're very well positioned to pursue interdisciplinary type research and make real contributions. But then it comes also with challenges. So I, I fully agree with uh, Uger that it's very important still to continue very rigorous training 
to our students, like uh, to me, uh, in my field, mathematics, uh, physics, chemistry, you know, fundamental biology, they're so critical. So instead of uh, sometimes you come in um, with, uh, for students, you know, they really, they're excited about, uh, you know, some important questions. But uh, uh, at the end, during your first two years, it's still very critical to, to get a really rigorous, robust uh, fundamental training before you can make real contributions to, to a complex uh, problem. So, so, that's, uh, um, so, so that's one thing. And uh, so another example, it's kind of triggered by yesterday. I, I still have a regular my weekly group meeting. And so in my group, we usually have kind of a little split. 70% of people work on very fundamental kind of physics, uh, fluid physics. And the other 30% are more composition from students. They're more interested in applied technology, biotechnology. And, and so, so we kind of mix and match. And, and sometimes you can see a certain group were not as engaged. But yesterday, we, uh, we had a really uh, interesting small project presented by a research intern on developing polymers for um, biotechnology applications. He also did some experiments related to kind of rheology and physics. And uh, so we actually found some really cool results. So that really promoted really active uh, discussions among everyone. So, so I think always is a, a great place, I, I think, uh, for young researchers to pursue this kind of line of uh, research and area. Sorry. Thanks, Amy. And uh, since you pointed out uh, all the new disruptive or exciting uh, areas that are coming up, like gene editing, CRISPR, CAS, uh, AI, etc., I wanted to ask, since all of you tend to travel around the world, meet with lots of thinkers, scholars, uh, what what exciting new areas are you witnessing? What disruptive or unexpected advances are you coming across in, in your travels? Uh, so we'll proceed from Amy onwards uh, from left to right again. Thanks. OK, thanks. Um, yeah, so, so maybe I will start from uh, my, my research area in microfluidics and rheology. That's also related to material science. So what I see, at, at least in our field, there's, uh, for the past 10 years, there's, uh, so one is related to coupling microfluidics with uh, biotechnology and uh, for applications in gene editing and to personalize medicine and to contribute to kind of uh, the, the healthcare system. And that's also when AI uh, came in. Um, even, so, so when I first joined OIS 10 years ago, so I was approached by um, a big healthcare company in Japan, uh, Sysmax, it's based in Kobe. And uh, so we worked with them for three years on developing kind of uh, nanofluidic immunoassays. But at the end, uh, the company decided uh, the, the mass production kind of uh, ability, it's, it's not ready. So in the country, I think globally. But at the same time, I, I learned that. So their major strength is uh, to collect enormous patient data. So I was told that in 10 years, so their company, so I'm very curious to see that will be ahead of the forefront because they have been really focusing on kind of patient-doctor relationship. And with the goal that then the patients are, will be willing to share their personal medicine data. And uh, so, so that's kind of an interesting example. So what I see in our field that uh, at the end, so, so many of these kind of key components will come together. Thank you. Thank you. I just end with um, what I talked about was really important with the question why, but why is it important with the why question? Uh, I think that in order to not only make prognosis, for example, in medicine, but also to come up with ideas of cures, you need to understand stuff. So it's not only, to say, oh, th this looks like a cancer tumor, but yeah, but can we do something about it, right? I think that we, we have to go back to, to pr push that a little bit harder as well. And, uh, and especially one challenge that is um, from yesterday's news that uh, Geoffrey Hinton got the no will get the Nobel Prize in Physics, and I mean, he's one of the founders of the really efficient d deep learning networks now. And he has also made a, 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 you know, a turn in the sense that 
he realized the, the great danger in the, what he has created. And that is something that we seldom see as someone who is you know, so much into the field and then see that maybe this is dangerous, maybe I've created something that... And so he's, he's talking quite a bit about that, and that has been something that has been... Okay, so I've been into this a little bit since my biology took me into this artificial life, and I tried to study evolution by some experimental things. And I, I'm so impressed by evolution, how good it is. And you cannot foresee what's happening. And of course, we cannot foresee what will happen with the, with the artificial things that we're talking about, intelligence as well. So I I'm, I'm think that this is a really huge challenge, that uh, when the computers get so clever that it's going to be a bit dangerous, how can we make the transition in a good manner? And for that, we need understanding. And I think more forces, maybe one promille of all things that are put into the AI could be also been trying to understand how we can make that for the best of the humankind. <clears throat> yeah, uh, this very exciting development, which I would like to share, which is also connects to all, all previous questions, is uh, in, you know, this MSRI, one of the main uh, leading mathematical institutions in the world is MSRI. Uh, now it's called Simon Law for Mathematical Institute, and they have a semester programs. And usually mm -hmm. this semester topics is a kind of define also front line of this field and how it develops. So right now with a group of uh, six uh, mathematicians, uh, uh, myself and one uh, from professor from Oxford, MIT, and then uh, one uh, Virginia, and University of California at Berkeley. So we have suggested this proposal, the excitement about this proposal, which is already a letter of intent kind of approved. It's about topics is singularities and partial differential equations representing natural phenomena. Mm. So which is basically understanding the singularities, mathematical principles of singularities, and connecting so four different subfields. So I would call this interfields mathematical. So four fields, one is, as we mentioned, I mentioned, the colleagues, the potential theory of elliptic and parabolic partial differential equations. That's uh, uh, my expertise. And then we have mathematical theory of the shock waves, nonlinear conservation laws, understanding singularities. Third direction is a nonlinear Schrodinger equations and formation of singularities. And the fourth is, of course, the fluid mechanics, singularities from Navier Stokes, one mm -hmm. of the major mm -hmm. open math problems. So, one of the nice things with this uh, progress is that. In particular, this requirement of this also to create some summer school because that primarily will train also PhD students and the postdocs. And we already started the summer school. One is was just in this very same room together with a professor from Oxford. We had the summer school where we worked with 40 PhD students selected by MSRI worldwide, trained them. So next summer school was exactly this will be in 26th summer, which will prepare students for this uh, semester program, and then also will be connection will be associated follow up workshop after the semester will be also in this OIS. So that's I think one of the very excited development, which I think in particular will promote this uh, uh, understanding of singularities is, is a huge contribution also to understanding the physics major problems of mm -hmm. open problems in physics, and that was the most exciting development I think which. I, AI will, of course, revolutionize all research areas as we know them. As that happens, also the public, the society, will enter into research. There will be a lot of ideas, hypotheses presented, a lot of ideas to be tested. Uh, there are some last frontiers, space. We should not be lost in the fourth quadrant. Um, also, little explored is a deep sea for geology and my marine biology. Uh, for my own field, materials, uh, we should mind developing materials, re-engineering materials for a sustainable society and development. Uh, we cannot uh, consume or transform so much energy in the IT digitalization. We need less energy consuming components. We need to re-engineer concrete not to give out six or seven percent of our mankind's footprint on carbon dioxide, construction materials. So from all the esoteric model systems that we can study in chemistry or physics, pick a system that has relevance also for sustainable development. The combinatorics is enough to, to find that. And to do that, we need to interact and to get ideas what are the, the relevant problems 
and the potentially relevant model systems. May I add one last comment? I, I added a drawing to the, to the whiteboard. This is a diagram of the basic understanding <coughs> of the slide. I call it the Meitner, Pasteur Meitner quadrant. I'd like everyone to do that from today on. Marie Curie equal to Borg. Neri Kronberg uh, was a, a Swedish um, farm ruler who developed in the 20s and 30s dry milk. The company still exists in Sweden. She died, uh, she died uh, without the resources because uh, she didn't get the revenues, the royalty on our discoveries. Uh, but she made this development work like just like This is a place without point to be. I, I think one of the biggest challenges to come for interdisciplinary research is the integration of social science and humanities. Uh, we have already relatively well-functioning teams involving natural scientists and engineers, science and technology. Uh, this is often working well, but um, in the history of science, we have often seen that maturation steps happen when science becomes quantitative. Quantitative analysis, quantitative modeling, computational solutions are a sign of a science taking another step in its maturation. And um, that is currently creating a gulf between the natural science and the, the social science, because social scientists often write essays and um, exchange in terms of um, purely verbal and qualitative reasoning. Um, I think there is a lot to be gained and hopefully that will be a positive form of disrupt disruptive transformation in the future to create a quantitative science of human behavior. Almost all the challenges that we are facing are not technocratically solvable. Uh, human, humankind needs to change its behavior, and the question is how do we describe this change? How do we nudge this change? And um, this needs to be a confluence of at least uh, four areas of knowledge uh, coming from economics. Uh, since about 20 years, we have behavioral economics, which teaches us quantitatively about human behavior in the wild, so to speak. We have evolutionary biology, which is uh, in with game theory doing a similar um, similar reasoning, um, but try to explain why we are seeing certain behaviors, not just what we see, but why we see it. And then we have the humanity dimension of sociology and psychology. And these are still incredibly fragmentized and siloed, and uh, I see a lot of potential in further integration. Thank you. Thank you, Ulf. Thank you all. So uh, it, it's not my intention to ask all the questions and, and force uh, our panelists to give the answers. If, if any of you in the audience has any questions, comments, clarifications, this is the time to proceed, please. We have, okay, we have a question there. Uh, yes, so maybe coming back to one of the challenges of this interdisciplinary research, do you think that globally PhD programs are not too structured around over-specialization in a particular field? And if so, like how can we maybe promote um, specializing in all of or interdisciplinary research instead of over-specialization? If, if I may start, so we, in, in uh, Gothenburg, we had, the, when the bioinformatics was the answer to everything, we had um, pair PhD students so they paired up one from each field, so they were, had a proper, you know, they, they didn't half it, 100% in one, uh, it could be, you know, mathematical statistics or computer, and the other was a biologist. But they, they went side by side and had this joint project, so they helped each other, and, and I thought that was really good, to try to, to do what you want, and, and I agree with that and you as well, to keep the proper, you know, classical training, but still have, something that they, they grew into. So, so they became a new kind of species that has been really successful. Thank you. I can add my own two cents worth to it. Even though I'm not a panelist, I'm just moderating. 
When I was a PhD student, what I learned from my advisor was a PhD is a proof of concept that you can formulate a question and attack it and give a solution within a reasonable amount of time. So it is not a specialization that is so important to the PhD. It is the process of, it's like trial by fire. You, you, you come out, the end of the tunnel changed. And that is what is special about a PhD. So it shouldn't matter what discipline or the structure is not the important part, but how you go about formulating the question and attacking the problem to come up with a solution. Maybe I can also provide some perspectives. Um, as I mentioned, my, my degree, PhD degree, was in theoretical and applied mechanics. Um, in the year 2000, there were only two such departments uh, in the United States, Cornell University and UIUC. And uh, so I remember a lot of my classmates, we were having a hard time to, to find a position because traditionally it's kind of, uh, if you look at at least in the academic realm, um, you know, recruiting in you know, engineering, like chemical engineering, bioengineering, mechanical engineering. But at the end, we all kind of, those who ended up in academia, we all ended up in mechanical engineering because some sounds similar. There's mechanics and mechanical engineering. So uh, this observation is, uh, so I, I felt like uh, the infrastructure, the mindset, and also the, the university wasn't really up to date yet um, in year 2000. But if I, I look around, you know, the, the current like recruiting cycle from different university, I think it's, uh, it's more open, but uh, probably there's still a, a lot more to be improved. I think that will be related to policy making and university of, uh, management and so on. May I continue the answer on the question about the, the benefits of having interdisciplinary PhD student exchange? Um, th th there is a problem with that, um, it comes from how money is streaming through the system. So often a professor is applying from an external funding agency to, to set up an interdisciplinary research program which would include the PhD student or postdoc student exchange. Uh, that problem is the fairly long startup time. So it means that it could come out of phase with the best window of opportunity um, in that student's career. So then if it is to work, it should be a graduate school, then it becomes institutionalized, and then comes the risk of ossification or stagnation. So I would part maybe with the gentleman uh, to my other side here saying that what you should do is to concentrate on becoming very good in, in some discipline, and then find the context of collaboration after that, and go in and out of collaborations, always seeking the, the relevant problems. Oh, just following up on what Professor Holtman said before about collaborations and like not getting too stuck into sort of consolidating things too much. So I experienced like, I don't think I'm saying it uh, something new, but like th th there is been like a growing tension in the last 20 years in society about like, you know, like tension between centralized process and decentralized process, processes, and, and also like, in academia, like, we do want to create some structure and sort of come up with uh, triangles or, or squares or like, uh, but we also are like in front of like a lot of young uh, scientists who uh, have a lot of experience, like have, have a lot of knowledge about AI and a lot of like interesting tools, even more than PIs, and they have very great ideas. Um, so giving them the opportunity to actually grow some ideas from the bottom, it's actually quite relevant, but they might a bit, be a bit like confused and like uh, lack the, the rigorous and the sort of approach, so they need to be guided, so we need also centralized efforts, but I think I hope we will manage in society and academia to sort of find this tension um, um, so the challenges of this tension and bring home some useful insights, also like giving the opportunity to students to, you know, follow their intuitions and follow their drives, even if they're not like too much structure. So giving them space to explore some ideas, but then still sort of give some guidance because P 
APIs have been working and they know what are the problems. So finding a solution to this tension, I think it's one of the most challenging problems of society in many, many sort of aspects. So I wonder like what you think and if, there is, if you see any solution or any, any way forward. Was that a question? I'd like to take it as a question and comment. Uh, so what you are drawing out is, is a field uh, of um, intentions. Uh, I will make a quick drawing. Yeah, well, um, so it's interesting. Uh, the, this is you, uh, or it is, let's call it, call it. <laughs> so, the, the funding agency would like you to go in this direction. This is a vector, basically. So another funding agency want you to go in this direction. If the vectors are equally long, they will not move anywhere. <laughs> and, and then you have a, a lot of other intentions from the external system, the external funding agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, one of these is interdisciplinary uh, research. But you have to mind what you do in the other intention, so that you are not uh, eating to this, the strength of this sector. I'm sure the board meetings at always are, are full of such uh, vector diagrams. Uh, and then they find a wise compromise. Well, this is a board meeting. You're at the board and you have <laughs> So, as I said, I start with humor and I end with humor. Red has already given me the indication that we have plenty of food for thought and it is lunchtime. So let's, let's thank all our panelists and all, thank you all for coming.